So we have come to a permissive generation. When Solzhenitsyn, that man who'd been in the gulag for years, when he was asked, why, why all this misery upon Russia? He said, because we forgot God. Can I give you a little bit of history? Because the only defence against the world is to understand it. And you must understand history or you repeat it. For 200 years before World War II, the wise men of Earth planned utopias. The most well-known is Karl Marx. And his followers ultimately conquered 60% of the world. 60% of the world. But the result was horrific. 70 million deaths in Russia, unnecessarily. Under Mao in China, 30 to 40 million deaths. So it didn't turn out to be a utopia. Under the collective farming scheme, the peasants would say if they were asked, well, the government pretends to pay us and we pretend to work. <laughs> and so there was no prosperity in Russia. It wouldn't work. The reason for the debacle that came about 1990 because Russia economically could not keep up with USA in manufacturing weapons. They didn't have the finance. Despite cataracts of oil, but their people wouldn't work. The government pretends to pay us and we pretend to work. So you have 200 years where the intellectuals of the world epitomised in Karl Marx, that brutal man whose daughter's suicided and whose wife's heart was broken, who suffered from boils because he ate so terribly and he was bad-tempered and irritable and couldn't make friends with anybody or keep a friendship with anybody. He's a man that planned utopia. It's very interesting that once you come... <clears throat> to the eve of the French Revolution, the event that changed the world, there's already been a change. Hitherto, common people, many of them couldn't read, went by the common wisdom that if you were honest and truthful, you had a fair chance of surviving the bangs and slams of life. But if you were willingly against God you are inviting trouble. So up to the French Revolution, many of the common people believed that. But with the Enlightenment in the 18th century, that changed. Diderot and Rousseau and Voltaire, these moved God off the throne of the hearts of the people and put reason there. But reason failed. Communism failed because it didn't take into account the irrationality of the human heart. We are not pure creatures of reason. You and I are moved by instinct, by intuition, by impulse. None of us are fully and constantly and consistently rational. And that's why all the utopias failed. <coughs> You've heard of George Orwell. He wrote Animal Farm, 1984. Great books. They're about the perils of a totalitarian society. They take less than an hour to read, but I recommend them to you. George L. Orwell was a, a, one of the last of the intellectuals that thought you could have a utopia. He was one of the thousands of men from America and England and Europe that went to Spain to assist the Republicans against the loyalists. The Republicans were assisted by Russia, the Nationalists were assisted by Germany and Italy. Hitler sent 10,000 Germans to Spain to fight against the Republicans. But it was with the Republicans that there were men like Ernest Hemingway, you know the story for whom the bell tolls, and thousands from America who had an idealistic view of life. 
George Orwell went there and what he found was that on both sides of the coin, the Republicans and the Nationalists, there were terrible cruelties. There was no real concern for individuals and all gave up all hope in a worldly utopia. And he represented the intellectuals of the world, many of whom had been communists, because communism seemed to offer good ideals, but it never took into account human nature. But after World War II, things changed, and you can't understand 2009 unless you understand what we're now talking about. After World War II, things changed and the intellectuals who moved the masses were preaching a gospel of hedonism, living for pleasure, Sybarite experience, fulfill your lusts. It had three components, sex, violence and drugs. Let me give you a few examples. You may not have heard of Cyril Connolly, but he, more than anybody else, was responsible for the age of permissiveness that swept over Europe and America after World War II. Cyril Connolly was a very smart man, not a good man, but a smart man. Most of the intellectuals are smart, but they're usually not good. I'd far rather meet a good person any day than a smart one, but best of all, a smart one who's good. But Cyril Connolly had a magazine that went all over America and England and Europe called Horizons, in which he advocated a lot of things. The abolishing of censorship, so four-letter words could be in normal literature and be heard on the media. The abolishing of divorce laws, abolishing the death penalty, and a whole series of things, all of which were enacted in the next decade in both America and England, all of them. I should tell you something about the man that sponsored this new era of permissiveness. He was a hated guest by people who'd had him once. I'll tell you why. He would stay at one man's house and leave without paying the laundry bill. At another house, they found bathroom residues in the base of the grandfather clock. In another home where he'd been entertained, they found pots of festering sh shrimp residues left in the bedroom. In another home, there were half-eaten meals in the drawers of the, the cupboards of the bedroom. And I like this one best of all. The, the host's books were found to have strips of spaghetti or bacon rashes marking the page where Cyril Connolly had been reading and then put the book back. But he marked it with pieces of spaghetti and bacon rashes. You might like this one better. When he was dining with a very famous American intellectual whose wife had prepared a special dish for all the guests, he just shook his cigar ashes into that dish before it was served up. That was Cyril Connolly. That was Cyril Connolly. Uh, 